just been diagnosed. And I'm like, why is she sending me her COVID test by WhatsApp? And it took me a minute to realise that she hadn't sent me a COVID test. And nine months later, she had this beautiful, beautiful baby, Helena. And, you know, Sarah had resigned herself that she would not have another child. This is this occurred several years after she completed her tamoxifen. It didn't appear that, to be that her fertility was where she would have liked it to be. And she had already really made peace with the fact that she only had one child. And then this came along as a wonderful surprise. And then this is about seven months later at a function um, celebrating survivorship uh, where I had the honour to be here with Sarah and beautiful baby Helena. So there is lots of hope um, um, for women with breast cancer day today with higher cure rates, the possibility of fertility preservation, of having children and for women for, to fulfil their dreams and hopes. And thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Shani, for this wonderful presentation. We love you. Thank you so much. So I've gotten so many unanswered questions already, but we'll come to that later. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll, we'll introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tessie Amadru, Clinical Oncologist, Federal Medical Center, Abuja. You have the floor, ma'am. Okay, please. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, please, can I have my slides uploaded? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Good evening. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the two previous speakers. I think they have made my work very easy. Um, I'll be speaking about the impact of breast cancer treatment on sexual and sexuality and the quality of life. So. Um, as the burden of cancer increases worldwide, we expect to have um, you know, more improved um, effective screening, diagnosis, treatment, and even supportive care intervention. And this, of course, would affect the long-term survival of uh, cancer patients. And with this, we expect that uh, patients, when patients survive, we have, there's an increased need for sexual health intervention because most of uh, the treatments that we give may affect uh, sexual health of patients in one way or the other. And so sexual health status has become the focus of concern among patients with cancer, cancer undergoing treatment. Uh, sexual health problems are actually becoming one of the most common issues among patients with uh, cancer. Several studies have shown that uh, and Cancer and its treatment can affect the sexual function, satisfaction, the well-being of these patients, and then the relationships of the patient. So it's not just the patient that is being considered in this, even their partners are involved. And many cancer survivors are at risk of developing psychophysiological symptoms, including sexual dysfunction. Next slide, please. So according to the WHO definition of um, sexual health, it's, uh, it says it's the status of social, mental, emotional, and physical well-being concerning an individual's sexuality throughout life. So it's not just, um, it's, it involves both the social aspect, the mental aspect, emotional aspect, and physical well-being of an individual's um, sexuality. And the sexual need is one of the most basic needs that just as we have food, drink, and sleep, Sexual needs are actually basic physiological needs for human survival. And we have had various studies uh, uh, of patients with breast cancer that have reported you know, the prevalence of sexual uh, dysfunction and sexual distress to be as high as 80. Uh, some studies have shown 75, but most of the studies that I went through have not even shown uh, less than a 50% uh, um, prevalence of uh, sexual dysfunction in both men and women. In other parts of the world, especially um, uh, our uh, developing world, studies have also shown a decrease in sexual function over time for both patients and their partners. And sexual uh, satisfaction and intimacy were also affected. So sexual health and quality of life. 
uh, when patients develop, uh, when patients come with uh, cancer, apart from treating them and curing them of their disease, one of the most important things we also think about is their sexual health. And their sexual health is not only a significant aspect of their life, but it's also a fundamental factor related to their quality of life. So they work hand in hand. The sexual health of a patient um, affects uh, the quality of life of the patient and um, is receiving increasing as attention as an important predictor of treatment and prognosis in patients with uh, cancer. And in the context of increased cancer burden and prolonged survival, the quality of life is greatly affected by the sexual health of the patient. So quality of life, sexual health, they go hand in hand. And sexual health concerns are common in breast cancer patients uh, who had surgery, but they are often overlooked. Next slide. So there are treatment complications, uh, sexual dysfunction, and lack of sexual activity are the major factors that impair the quality of life of cancer survivors. Um, the negative effect of sexual problems on patients, on the patient's well-being, have been well studied and have, they have shown that sexual problems affect not only the patients, but their partners, as I've said before. And this may cause strain on their uh, relationship. And remember that um, as we define sexual health, it also involves the emotional uh, aspect of uh, the patient. So patients with cancer who receive treatment report lower sexual function and quality of life than the general population. And studies have also shown that sexual rehab rehabilitation interventions can effectively improve psychosexual and sexual function and promote the quality of life of patients with cancer. Next slide. So breast cancer and sexual health. We know that breast cancer is the most common type of cancer among women worldwide. And uh, we're beginning to, we, uh, we have, uh, is the most prevalent uh, cancer also. So upon hearing the diagnosis of breast cancer alone, a woman faces so many challenges. It includes, you know, the emotional distress, uh, body image issues and sexual dysfunction. And I must say that this, um, as mild as it may seem, has is is one of the reasons why patients also present late because the moment they they are diagnosed with breast cancer, they think you know about all that is going to happen to them. Uh, they are going to lose their breasts, their body image may not remain, you know, perception of themselves may not remain the same, and things like that. And so it affects from you know presentation to even accepting treatment, compliance with treatment, and the general quality of life of the patient at the end of the day. So since the number of breast cancer survivors have increased in the past years due to more effective treatment, there's also a need for more attention for improving the patient's sexual well-being and quality of life. Sexual problems are common among, uh, uh, after breast cancer treatment and the, with an estimated prevalence of 85%, that means for Every 100 patients uh, with breast cancer that have had treatment, about 85% of them would have one, one or more uh, sexual related problems. Next slide. It is well known that breast cancer treatment can affect sexuality. I, I just took this um, uh, particular study. There are a lot of them, but this study by Albert et al. in the Journal of Sex and Marital Therapy evaluating the needs of breast cancer patients and their partners, their partners regarding sexual care showed the following. I put them in red because they are very important uh, uh, considerations that we as clinicians and even healthcare professionals treating patients would have to bear in mind. Uh, in that study, the majority of patients and their partners, as high as 80% of the patients and 73% of the partners did not receive any information regarding sexuality, and only a quarter of all re respondents reported a direct need for the information. Of course, most of them may not understand how well the, you know, the treatment will affect their sexuality, uh, but most of them valued an opportunity to discuss sexuality with their uh, healthcare providers. And in that study, the nurses were the most preferable care provider to provide information about sexuality to the patient. And patients and partners consider sexual information before the start of treatment as the most suitable timing 
of discussing sexuality. So this study, like um, really, I, I took this because it really uh, just mirrors what happens in uh, our locality and uh, you know mirrors our local experience. Next slide. So breast cancer treatments includes, of course, we know patients who may, depending on the stage of uh, diagnosis, patients may uh, be will may need to have surgical treatments. Um, depending on the, uh, you know, the extent of the surgery may depend on the stage of the disease and um, other factors. Uh, patients may also undergo radiotherapy, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, and even immunotherapy. And any of these treatments alone or in combination can cause you know, a strain on the sexual health of the patient. And I'll just uh, take some of the uh, sexual problems that come with uh, most of this treatment. We have physical sexual problems, losing parts. Of course, the, 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 uh, the one of the very common uh, worries that the women would, you know, think about when, you, when they are diagnosed with breast cancer is um, surgery, having a mastectomy. Uh, either losing part of the breast or one or both of the breasts. Uh, surgical scars, as little as that sounds, there are some patients that cannot even look at their scars or their scars give them nightmares or give them anxiety or even depression. Uh, there's weight gain or loss. There's also hair loss. As little as these things may uh, sound, uh, they have uh, very far-reaching uh, consequences on the sexual health of the patient. Uh, we have also physical and mental exhaustion from breast cancer diagnosis. It can also cause delay in treatment, hence affecting early presentation or treatment com compliance. Physical changes uh, like this may often lead to body image issues, and uh, you know the patients may it may cause some of them to feel very self conscious, making it difficult to en enjoy sex. There's also psychological sexual problems, um, for example, disturbance in body image. Uh, patients feeling physically unattractive, uh, patients, uh, you know, they could also, uh, it could also affect the sexual uh, function regardless of treatment. Next slide. There's also the loss of libido, uh, sexual desire. This may be caused by a lot of things, a lot of um, uh, uh, treatment side effects such as uh, problems with vaginal lubrication, uh, decreased nipple sensation, and even reduced desire due to treatment-induced menopause. So there are a lot of things that can cause uh, loss of libido. There can also, this may also include, there might also be nausea, fatigue, and because of depression, or even patients that um, experience anxiety, fear, stress, or the side effects of, uh, of their treatment. You know, fear of the side effects of their treatment may reduce their libido and then uh, affect uh, their sexual health. Uh, the discomfort or pain during or immediately after sex is also uh, one of the uh, sexual problems that breast cancer patients can, uh, can experience. And you can get that um, in patients who have, um, who have undergone chemotherapy and uh, have been triggered into early menopause, especially the younger patients. And then there's a negative body image after certain breast cancer treatments. Of course, like the surgery, uh, after chemotherapy, when patients um, have hyperpigmentation, they are, you know, those with light skin become very dark. They don't even want to go out. They don't want people to see them. Uh, and even after radiation. And in addition to issues with body image, breast surgery and other breast cancer treatments can cause pain in the breast and in other parts of the body. And it makes sex very uh, physically uncomfortable or may not be pleasurable for the patient. Yes, the big one in the room is relationship stress and strain. We are beginning to get uh, a lot of our younger patients, patients in the ritual reproductive age group, or patients that are just about starting, uh, you know, marital life or have not even uh, are yet to get married, come down with breast cancer. And what we find is that the most important worry that they struggle with is their relationship because um, so many things, um, you know, may cause a strain, a stress on their relationship. And the partners do experience some of these changes and they struggle with it. So um, like we said earlier, it's not just the patient, even the partners are involved in all this. Uh, attention for patient-partner relationship is very important since being an, in an intimate relationship with affectionate behavior and emotional closeness is associated with a better outcome for the patient. So 
the spouse, uh, the partner has to be carried along. Lack of communication about the subject may lead to problems with coping. So before patients even start, um, the patient starts treatment, you know, the, the patient and the partner have to be carried along uh, and, you know, uh, also explain, you know, things that are likely to happen uh, during the treatment or after the treatment. Relationship quality can be considered the most important predictor of sexual satisfaction, function, and desire after breast cancer. So most of our patients, you know, uh, put this in mind and, you know, their worries are, will they be able to, you know, keep their relationship, will they be, especially for those ones that are just newly into marriage or are about getting uh, married. It is therefore very important that both the partners are offered information and counseling and participate in decision-making. However, where breast cancer survivors do not wish to involve their partners, this must be also respected. Next slide. So sexual health in younger women with breast cancer. I just made this slide because it's uh, the younger women, this is not to say the older women do not struggle with um, sexual health problems, but I think because the younger women have a lot more things to worry about, uh, I made this slide just to, uh, you know, uh, so that we can see how, you know, the sexual health of younger women are affected when they have breast cancer. The younger women struggle with decision making, for treatment, trying to maintain a sexual relationship because of the patient's fear of being abandoned by the partner or even infertility. So they struggle. When you want to discuss their treatment um, uh, uh, outline, they have to consider all these things, keeping their relationship, keeping their fertility as, as much as they want to also, you know, have the treatment and all that. They also suffer more severe disruption of body image compared to the older ones anxiety, sleep disorders, dissatisfaction with relationships, and the fear of relapse is commoner in the younger women. Studies have also shown that future fertility status is one of the main concerns in women of the productive age group. So when they come and you discuss, you know, the treatment and everything, the first thing they are asking, uh, most of the time they want to know, will this treatment affect fertility? Will they be able to carry pregnancy? Will they be able to breastfeed their children. And so those are all the questions that they ask. And these are sexual health problems that are more, you know, uh, that um, are seen in the younger women with breast cancer. These women are worried about being infertile because of chemotherapy and other cancer treatments they would have. Uh, and the women of reproductive age group, they need more information about fertility preserving options as the, the last speaker has said, before starting breast cancer treatment. So most guidelines recommend postponing uh, pregnancy for at least two years after the uh, breast cancer is treated, depending on the stage of the disease and the treatment received. This also has its own downside because it prolongs their childbearing years. And for those that are almost at menopause, they are also, you know, it creates anxiety uh, for them. Some breast cancer treatments such as chemotherapy and hormonal therapy can lead to early menopause and with all the attendant side effects. For younger women, they are not yet, you know, they, they, they weren't prepared for menopause. So when this comes, you know, like um, it tilts them into early menopause and of course, all the attendant side effects that come with uh, menopause. Younger breast cancer patients need more evidence-based information from their healthcare providers around hormonal therapies as the, um, previous speaker has said, as well as ovarian tissue or egg freezing. So they need to be, you know, offered all these options. They need to discuss the options and know what to choose and how to preserve their, uh, their uh, you know, their fertility. And this helps them. It helps their sexual health. It helps their quality of life. And overall, these women are more prone to worse sexual health than the older women. Next slide. So breast cancer and sexuality and um, body image. Uh, most of these women uh, would need uh, information on processes or breast reconstruction uh, surgery options and alternatives. And I've said it that most of the time we, we, we tend to forget the plastic surgeons. But I think that um, women need to go to see the plastic surgeons. Like I, I tell the surgeons in my hospital, I said, it's even very reassuring for them. It helps them. You know, it gives them that um, reassurance that even when you lose the breast, there are other things that can be done to help you, you know, regain your sense of femininity, to help you, uh, you know, have something that looks um, very much like what you have lost. 
And so they may need, you know, breast reconstruction surgery after mastectomy for many reasons, including regaining a sense of femininity, improving symmetry, the beauty of the breast. It even helps some of them to forget about, you know, the disease, enhancing marital relationship also. Let's not forget about, uh, you know, and recovering sexual attractiveness. Some women report that they feel unattractive to their sexual partners during sexual activity due to the loss of their breasts. So it's a big thing for some women, and that's why they feel that their physical attractiveness has reduced. Their self-confidence also has increased, and their marital relationship has improved after breast implant surgery. So let's not take these things for granted. This patient, this, uh, patient should be... Um, you know, especially in developing countries, um, in our third world countries where we think, oh, the patients may not be able to uh, afford breast reconstruction. But just seeing the plastic surgeon and, you know, having someone tell you about the options that you have to be able to, you know, keep your body image is um, uh, something that will help them go through the journey of, um, you know, having a mastectomy and also improve their sexual health. And some women we are reluctant to use external processes every day because they are not comfortable with it. So you know, all these things have to be discussed with them. The plastic surgeon also, um, you know, help them through um, um, going through all these things. Next slide. So there are some sexuality misconceptions that also need to, you know, um, talked about. Uh, these women need to be. You know, there has to be clarity around some of these uh, things. Some women decline reconstruction surgery after mastectomy to, due to their self-perceived stigma. Some of them feel that, um, you know, when you have breast implants, breast augmentation, people don't, you know, you are not seen as being complete. And so that stigma around it may, you know, reduce their uh, sexuality and then um, uh, it affects their uh, sexual health. They also believe breast reconstruction after mastectomy increases the risk of breast cancer. So women have to be carried through with all these things. You know, they have to help them um, to dispel some of these misconceptions. Some women with breast cancer believe that having sexual activity during or after chemotherapy is not safe for themselves and their partners due to the side effects of chemotherapy. So they have to be walked through, you know, the different um ways um, of um, having family planning, protecting themselves, uh, but yet still enjoying sex and still, you know, keeping their relationship, uh, their sexual life uh, active with their partners, even though they are on active treatment. They also believe that sexual activity stimulates the secretion of their sex hormone and then increases the risk of breast cancer reoccurrence. So these are all the things that the patients need to be walked through and, you know, help to dispel some of these uh, misconceptions. And remember that all these sexual misconceptions influence the quality of life of the women. So when they are, when they, they understand and they, these things are dispelled, they tend to, their quality of life improves. So what are the recommendations? Um, um, some of the recommendations that, uh, uh, you know, we, we need to have um, psychosocial and psychosexual counseling. It should be offered to all patients with cancer, especially breast cancer patients, aiming to improve their sexual response, their body image um, perception, intimacy, relationship issues. Oncology care providers uh, must also pay more attention to the sexual need of their patients. If you, these are things that if you don't pay attention to them, you will never remember to even walk your patient through it. And these are the silent things that you know, affect the quality of life of the patient. The medical oncologist should also pay attention to sexual function changes in long-term cancer survivors. Of course, we have um, the survivors, uh, by the time they have survived and they are off treatment, all they worry about now is all those other things, the complications that have come from their treatment and all the other things that have arisen from, you know, the uh, uh, treatment they have had. And we must explore more feasible and effective sexual health interventions for these patients. And we must also remember to integrate sexual health care into oncology medicine. It is very essential. All health pro uh, care professionals need to stay up to date on current updates related to sexual health among cancer patients. It would be criminal not to remember to, you know, treat the sexual health uh, aspect of your patient while you do yeah, your normal chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and all that, it should be in the forefront because uh, patients struggle with it and it affects their quality of life a great deal. So sexual health care should be fully integrated into medical oncology. 
and the sexual health issues should be addressed in all cancer survivors. Healthcare providers should routinely provide information on sexuality and discuss this subject with their patients and their partners early in the course of treatment. They must discuss in the course of treatment what they should expect, how they can go around it, how they can navigate around all these things, the options that they have, and help them with even their choices. And then throughout the continuum of care. So after and before treatment, it's not the only time. When patients have also finished treatment or even during the treatment, when they start experiencing things like most of them are worried once they have chemotherapy and maybe after one or two cycles, they don't see their, uh, their menses again, they are worried. And so you have to, you know, it has to continue throughout the continuum of care. And then um, healthcare providers should also initiate the conversation throughout the uh, period of care, beginning as early as possible and refer patients to additional services if available. I just talked about the plastic surgeons, the plastic and reconstructive surgeons. Send the patient there, let them know that they have options. Let it encourage them and even improve their sexual health, well-being, and their quality of life. We should also discuss sexuality with patients and their partners before we start any form of treatment so as to help inform them about possible changes and help them to manage their expectations. The inclusion of the partner in the support or sex therapy is also very essential. Let's not forget because the partners will be there and losing the partner is a very huge um, source of you know, sexual health problems for them. And so we must carry the partners along, especially in younger women uh, where this is of great concern to them. Also, we should include sexuality in, in consultations repeatedly. Every time you see patients during treatment process, during follow-up, we should remember to, you know, ask them, give them more information, and also support them um, when they, you know, um, when they have these sex sexuality changes over time. Uh, we should have give them adequate information and support regarding their intimacy and sexuality. It helps to reduce distress in patients and in their partners. We should also encourage patients to join support groups. Talking to other people who are undergoing the same, you know, similar condition as you, you are is very helpful. So always, let's always encourage our patients to, you know, join support groups to be able to help them. When you hear people's experience, you hear, you know, how people have navigated all these things, you know, it helps them. We also encourage them to have exercise. Uh, it improves their well-being and it also boosts their mood alleviate their breast cancer treatment uh, side effects. And so let's encourage our patients to have, you know, exercise um, uh, and indirectly enhances the sexual satisfaction by improving their health, heart health and their mood. So in conclusion, breast cancer is associated with many physical, psychosocial, economical and sexual complications, which have a long-term negative impact on the quality of life of women with breast cancer, that if they are not addressed. So sexuality must be approached as an integral part of treatment to improve quality of life in breast cancer survivors. Sexual dysfunction following breast cancer diagnosis and treatment should be diagnosed and managed as a systemic approach, and it should be multidisciplinary. Everybody's hand should be on there. Every healthcare professional must uh, play their role to be able to help uh, you know, women navigate um, and have, you know, great sexual health and then, um, of course, uh, improved quality of life. Since the number of breast cancer survival is higher than the survivors of other types of cancer, more attention should be paid to the needs of women with breast cancer uh, and should be prioritized by the women's health professionals worldwide. More attention by health, prof health professionals, researchers, and policymakers on the sexual health needs of women with breast cancer is also recommended. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tessi. That was so um, so detailed, and I'm sure most of us, myself included, I've learned so much and I just know that some of my feelings are very valid um, and I know that that is um, the thought of most champions in the room today. Please keep your questions coming in the comment section so that we can uh, quickly um, start to collect them. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Tessie. This is beautiful. I've, I've put out, uh, I've even put some nuggets on our social media handles and so that you know, patients can get it. And please, I hope we get, okay, we have your slides already so we can keep engaging with it. Thank you, Dr. Tessie. So right now I'm looking at, um, looking at the chats so I can quickly uh, start asking the questions. But uh, first of all, Dr. Tessie, I, I have a question. Um, or maybe we should start from the ones for Dr. Shani. I don't know how exactly we should do this. Okay, let me start for questions for Dr. Shani first, then we'll come back to you. I hope that works for you. Okay, um, the first question for Dr. Shani, uh, somebody asked, for survivors or champions like so Tanja. Shani, Shani is not in the room. So any question oh, will so only sure. be answered by um, Tanja and Dr. Okay. Tessie. Dr. Please. Tessie. Okay, fine. Okay. Yeah. So this is for Dr. Tessie and um, Dr. Dr. Tanja. So anybody can just pick up this question. And the person is asking. For survivors or champions like Tanja who gave birth after treatment, are the kids being predisposed to any of the effects of treatment, especially after, especially chemotherapy effects? Would these kids later come down with issues arising from effects of cancer treatments their mothers went through? That is that's very good. Oh, oh. Dr. Tessie, you can go first since you're still uh, on the right. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get the question. It's raining here. Um, oh, I can to hear you. Yes, the rain is so heavy. Same here. Yes, okay, sorry. can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Okay, yes. fine. Please, you can answer the yes. question. Yes. Thank you. Should I repeat? Well, uh, as as I was told, if I can say Tanya here speaking, if I if I can say uh, as it was explained to me that after so many years there is no risk or any effects of treatment of chemotherapy or hormonal treatment on the babies or uh, on the kids that are born afterwards. So it shouldn't be. It should be safe. I think I saw a question earlier how long we should wait. Uh, for chemotherapy in Europe, they suggest we have to wait at least two years after chemotherapy to get pregnant. Uh, and after interruption of the hormonal treatment, as Shani was explaining in the positive trial, you have to wait at least three months for the flush out of the hormonal treatment and to get a regular period and then you can get pregnant with all different um, also with uh, IVF or uh, other fertility preservation techniques there's no high risk for any either stillbirth or uh, spontaneous abortion or for difficulties at least from the since the data in the positive trial Okay. okay. Maybe so if you, Dr. Tessie. Uh... Yeah, it's same. I think conveniently, um, it says that um, we should wait for two years after uh, treatment. Um, uh, this is to allow for any form of, um, you know, for treatment um, complications and any uh, um, affectation. Uh, so when a patient has, the, you know, delivers after then, there's no um, uh, risk, additional risk to that patient of developing any of those problems. And that's why it's, uh, uh, you know, it's advocated that patients um, wait, um, in, you know, give enough time so that everything, all the um, complications of uh, the chemo, the effects of the hormonal therapy and everything will have won off so that the patient, uh, the child does not stand in risk 
And it is also advised that during active treatment, patients should, you know, as much as possible, use um, any of the forms of uh, protection, especially barrier protection. Okay, thank you so much. I hope the uh, champion that asked that question um, has gotten enough clarification. So the second question I'm taking right now, can breast cancer survival try intro fertilization in order to conceive? That's the second question. Thank you. <laughs> Anja has already answered it in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is safe, and the, as the also results from the positive trials shows, it's it's very safe. It's no difference than a natural okay. conception. Okay, uh, Dr. Sanja, please, I would like to ask uh, as a follow-up question for all kinds of breast cancer, even estrogen positive. Sorry, I missed this last part. What did you ask? Oh, did you hear my question? Hello. Oh, can you hear, please? Okay. Hello, can you can you come again, please? Yes, okay. So so I asked a question. I said, um this uh, intro in, in vitro fertilization, yeah. Uh, intro fertilization in vital positive, no matter your kind of breast cancer, can you try this? Or is it a particular group that can try it? That's my question. With all different well, subtypes, it's, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I've not seen, we've not seen any study which shows that, you know, um, the hormone receptor positive ones, uh, uh, you know, would, should be excluded. For now. Hello, can you hear me, Gloria? Um, yes, yes. I, I lost you for a bit, so I can hear you now. Okay. 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 Thank you so much for, for that answer. Um, let me just quickly hand over to Shala to take some of the questions and I'll take the rest as well. Thank you. Shala, over to you. Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you, Dr. Tessi and Sanja. Okay, the question, I think one of the speakers already answered, but I'll still ask so that the champion can get a clear answer. Is it normal to have sex during any of the treatments, be it chemotherapy, radiation? Champion is asking if it's normal to have sex. Thank you. Yes, it is normal. It is normal. Uh, but patients should just remember to use, you know, uh, since they are actively uh, on treatment, to use um, protection, most especially barrier protection. But it's normal. As long as you're emotionally, uh, physically, you're not exhausted, mentally, once it's acceptable by you, yes, you can. All very right. normal. Thank you. For, okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Jesse. My second question. Is it safe to get pregnant during treatment? It's definitely during not safe. During treatment. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's definitely not safe, please. That's why okay. we encourage, you know, we encourage and always we remind, uh, especially premenopausal women, younger women that are still uh, within um, the childbearing age to use a barrier method, to use, you know, a protection um, during treatment so that they don't get pregnant. It isn't safe, please. Thank you, Thank you very much, Dr. Tessi. So that brings me to my next question. The champion is asking, how safe is plastic surgery or breast implant after surviving cancer? I think you mentioned something about it, but just yes, sir. Okay, as 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 far as I know, <laughs> plastic surgery is safe. But of course, that's why I said it is important that we now, you know, start integrating, you know, um, asking patients to see the plastic surgeons, uh, the plastic and reconstructive uh, surgeons, so that they can help with, 
You know, they will give you, you know, uh, all the available options. They will let you know what, you know, the effect of, um, you know, what options that you have. There are some that can actually raise flap and use, um, you know, pat your, your, you know, um, from your body and all that. So they will give you the available options. But um, as far as I know, um, uh, you know, breast implants are safe. They will also give you the, you know, the safe ones, the ones that you should use, the ones that, um, you know, they think are safe. So I think uh, by and large, I'm not a plastic surgeon, but uh, I think that that should be integrated. And um, as breast cancer patients, when you undergo treatment, I think you should ask, even if the doctors do not, uh, remember to send you to see the plastic surgeons. Out of curiosity, you can ask, even if you feel that you may not be able to afford it. There are so many other things that they can, you know, tell you about your, um, you know, your breasts and how you can, you know, um, uh, preserve your body image uh, perception and all that um, after treatment. Thank you so okay. much, Dr. Tessie. Yes, please. Let's, uh, um, Dr. Much, Tanya, do you have, uh, do you have anything to add to this? Because this issue uh, of breast, yes, this issue of breast transplant is um, a conversation. I I would agree with Dr. Has come Tessie up all the time. Yes, yeah. and people keep yes, yes. So please, what do you have to say from your own um, knowledge? Yeah, I would agree with all that Dr. Tessie already said, but we have to be very careful. We have to consult with our surgeons and we always have to see what are the options even. But so far, as we see, breast implants are safe. And even in some cases, if they were not safe, they were replaced. So we exactly. have a lot of options. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Tanja. So I... I have another question here and someone asked for endocrine responsive breast cancer coupled with PCOS. What do you advise for the way to go with treatment that also reduce the risk of endometrial cancer? Okay, that's uh, breast cancer with um... You're having PCOS too. I think um, what would happen in this in this situation is to work hand in hand with the gynecologist uh, to decide, you know, what is best for the patient and uh, you know the available um, options, and then choose what is best for the patient. I think we we'll for this we we'll have to work hand in hand with the gynecologist. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. And the other question, someone is asking, does a survivor's economic status play a role in catering for a baby born after mastectomy? That is, the baby would rely on formula and it may be a burden on poor survivors. So, um, it, it is a burden. It is a financial burden. <laughs> yeah, the financial uh, burden. Yeah, I had bilateral, so uh -huh. it is. It is. So you start sooner giving other foods before probably you don't uh, breastfeed. But yeah, it's, sa it's safe. Uh, kid babies are growing the uh, same as on a breastfeeding. But it is burden in Europe. It's around one thousand um, euros per four to to six months. So yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, do we have more questions, Lucia? Yes, I have a question for Tanja. So okay. someone is asking that is it safe to breastfeed? From your you are a survivor. You had a baby after your treatment. That is it safe to breastfeed your baby after treatment? That's for someone that have um mastectomy to one side of the breast. That is it safe to breastfeed with the other breast? Thank Very you. Very safe. Sammy. I think that this was already mentioned. If you have the other breast, you can feed from the rest. I think Shan was talking about this. Uh, but the problem is also radiation. If the breast was uh, irradiated, then it's very hard to breastfeed. But in any cases, is not enough. 
So um, even you, in that case, you should add some formula, but in bilateral mastectomy only, uh, formula is, is when, when milk you can feed to your baby. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much, Sandra. So the champion is asking that if you can share briefly with us how you were able to navigate getting into a relationship after your treatment. That was it so easy? Was it so hard? What did you do? <laughs> that, yes, thank you. This is question for me, yes? <laughs> well, yes. Um, I, uh, <laughs> well, I had a boyfriend when I was diagnosed and he was later became my, my husband. So it was maybe easier because we went through all of this together. And he was coming with me to all the treatments and he was mm. also informed about all the surgeries, about all the treatments, how it will be go ongoing, um, also premature menopause. I was in a menopause when I was 27, which is not very convenient, <laughs> but um, we went through all of this together. We talked a lot about it. We talked a lot about uh, with our doctors and asking questions and getting support. We also got the psychosocial support and talk with our psychologists and it was really, really helpful. But because I was happy with my treatment and I think this was really important that I was happy with my body and I was happy with all and accepting all that was coming. Also, my, my partner was also accepting this much better uh, because we were really open about everything and he was coming to me on every single checkup I had. So I think this is very important also for the support for the patient when you are going through the treatment. Yes. Thank you very much, Nanjam. Um, Gloria, over to you if you have more questions. Thank you. Yes. I'm looking at um, when is the right time to conceive after the entire treatment? Okay, that question has been answered. Can a survival yeah. attempt I can a can a survival attempt IVF? I think that was that, that has been answered too. That has been answered. Yeah, but, yes. yeah, but Gloria, you know, we can also just re-emphasize it and provide more okay. clarification because some okay. patients really were having network problem. You know, oh, just to clarify okay. more. I think that's why they were asking it again in the in the okay. WhatsApp group. That's what I'm saying. They just okay. need more clarification for both both from Tanja from her experience and as well, you know. Okay. Okay, please, let's just um, emphasize in a few minutes, Dr. Tessie and Dr. Sanja, please. Okay, yes. so like we said earlier, um, yes, the right time um, we said, like um, for after the after completion of treatment, uh, patients should wait um, for two years and then can get pregnant. This is because uh, you want to make sure that, you know, all the uh, probable side effects that will come with, you know, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and everything, every treatment that you have had, you know, has, um, you know, it has one off. And then even it helps your mental state. You don't want to get pregnant when you're thinking, oh, uh, I hope it's not going to affect my baby. I hope things are not, you know, and things like that. And also, you want to also be sure that, you know, uh, there's no need for any further treatment after that. You understand? Patient has been followed up. You have been followed up for two years complete, and there is no need. There will be no need for any further treatment. And then, you uh, you know, the coast is clear. You get pregnant. You're sure that, you know, the, you, you, you're not, you're not um, going to battle with any, um, you know, complications of the side effects of the treatment that uh, uh, you just had. And also, um, you are sure that, you know, uh, there's no recurrence, uh, there's no cost to worry about your disease, uh, uh, a, a, you know, a treatment that needs to come up again. So I think that's the reason why, you know, two years is enough time for you to be sure uh, of all this. And then, of course, we talked about the IVF. We said, uh, um, so far, there are no... Um, uh, you know, evidence to show that um, um, IVF is contraindicated in people in, in survival. So yes, uh, those were mentioned. So I don't know if Tanya has 
something to say? No, I, I totally agree with you, yeah. But it's very important, as we already mentioned a few times, to discuss this with your doctor and also with a gynecologist so you have all, all options and all information that you need. And I see now the second qu next question is about the Herceptin. I think it was already earlier. Uh, it's also the same. You okay. have to wait a few months for it. But if you had chemo, you have to wait for two years after the chemo regarding when did you yeah. end Herceptin. So. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And... Um... Someone uh, is saying, I'll, do, I'll just summarize. She's saying that it's obvious that there are so many things we don't discuss with our doctors in this part of the world. And that it's not clear to her that there are so many aspects. I can't really find the question, but I read it and I'm summarizing now. That um, it's clear to her that there are so many aspects of cancer that we don't cause extensively. Is their doctors and I, I quite agree because so many things have even for me who has been in this in the, in the sector for quite a while I'm just learning new things today I, I thought for someone with um, uh, estrogen positive um, breast cancer you are not supposed to get pregnant that is the conception I have and that is what I know most of us because we have these conversations among ourselves I don't know where we got that information. I can't remember now, but that is what I've always had in my head. And so this is so enlightening for all of us. Um, thank you so much for all the answers. And somebody is asking, somebody just dropped a question. As you said, for a patient who is advanced in age, please, somebody's, okay. For a patient who is advanced in age and still wants kids, for instance, and one who is heading towards their 40s, what options does she have to get pregnant if she has to wait two years or more after treatment, especially in developing countries where egg freezing is not so affordable? Well, here is the so, very depends which sub subtype, sorry, which, which uh, type of, of breast cancer it is. So if it's triple negative, I would say you can start earlier, but in hormone positive, you know, we should we should wait two years and then interrupt the endocrine therapy after 18 months uh, and then get pregnant and so on. Sorry. <laughs> so I, I think they, uh, she can also discuss, patients should also learn to discuss with the appropriate uh, people like... Uh, most of my patients with breast cancer, I tell them, go and see the gynecologist. Let them take you through the options. There are a lot of things now. We're talking about surrogacy. We're talking about adoption. Even though in developing countries like ours, we don't want to hear things like that. You want to carry your pregnancy to term yourself. But there are so many options that, you know, the gynecologist, the fertility experts can give you, uh, you know, that would, would help. And you can, you know, think about them. It's not so, I know that for most of the patients we send to, you know, see the fertility expert, they end up not being able to afford, you know, banking their uh, egg or embryo, you know, uh, but they, you know, some of them are offered yeah. medical, um, you know, uh, treatments. Um, most of them are giving um, uh, Zoladex to help with uh, preservation of the ovary and then they go ahead, have their chemotherapy and protected and then, have you know get um but for those ones unfortunately that are close to like you said the 40 year old uh that has to wait for two years and all that there are so many options that can be discussed uh um, with you and your partner of course uh and you know you can look at this option sometimes you just feel that oh no this is the end of it uh i can't have children but when you go and you know people that are experts in this field talk to you about you know what you can do the different options and how people, you know, sometimes you just feel that these things are, are, are out of reach or out of the world. But when they tell you, you know, they, they give you examples of people that have done these things and they are, you know, there, they are, you know, at the end of the day, what you want is a child. So I think uh, people, um, patients should learn to also, you know, but sometimes when you tell patients, go and see the gynecologist, they say, no, doctor, let's just continue. I can't afford. But I insist that they go because 
you may, you know, that you are not the experts. There are things that the person, uh, you know, the experts will tell you that you, you may not even, you are not even aware of them. And there are, you know, options that you can actually look into and uh, they will help you. Okay, um, thank you. So um, over to you, Shola. Okay, um, this is not a question, but I just want to um, share my opinion about getting into a relationship after cancer treatment. So for me, I would say you need to embrace your scar first. You need to love yourself. Do you know you, okay, now I have one breast, I don't have breast. Okay, do I love myself? Are you happy with yourself? Before you need to be emotionally stable before thinking of going into a relationship. And what I do advise champions is that make sure you are open to the person. Let them know what you have gone through and what is what okay, what's the next stage and everything. Do not hide information that will come out and the person will hurt you and you will be sad. And that is not good for us champions. So that's what I want to add. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shola. Thank you. And somebody asked, I'll, I'll, I'll lump these two questions in one because they are quite similar. And somebody asked, how safe that, okay, getting for uh, someone with a genetic uh, breast cancer to get pregnant, does it, um, is it going to trigger a, a, a recurrence? And somebody is also asking, egg stimulation for surrogacy, will it also stimulate recurrence so two things egg stimulation and a cancer that is genetic will these two things stimulate a recurrence that's the question thank you hello hello can you hear me yes yes okay, can you repeat the last part ahead. Okay, so two questions in one. Somebody wants yes. to know if um, someone that has uh, a cancer that is proven to be genetic, if getting pregnant can cause a recurrence for them, and someone who also wants to um, stimulate their uh, the egg stimulation for surrogacy, could it also cause recurrence? So this is a this is the, these are the questions. Oh, yeah, this is this is yeah yeah this is the, the I will first go to this egg stimulation hormone positive. It is safe. We have the results from the positive trial. It doesn't increase the yeah. chance of recurrence, so it, it is safe uh, for this. But for the first part of the question, for the first question, I didn't understand Genetic. right. Ah, genetic. If you mean probably for BRCA mutations yes. here, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So far, even in Europe and North America, this is not uh, an exclusion criteria. So BRCA mutation, it's not um, that limitation by it, by itself. So uh, even if you go through IVF, they don't exclude the embryos with uh, BRCA mutations. So. And also, this is because it's 50-50 chance to pass yes. the mutation to your uh, kid. So this is not an, any exclusion criteria. In Europe, you can go through fertility preservation to all other methods. It, it's not excluding anywhere. So it is safe. Safe. But now, I, yeah. OK. Uh, so the next question, maybe you could answer this, Dr. Tessie. Is it safe for okay. the baby to yeah, is it safe for the baby to continue medications while pregnant? Okay, so this is assuming um someone is on a five-year therapy and and then after two years as advised and the person gets pregnant, is it safe to continue taking that hormonal therapy? I think this is very special. No. Yes. No, while you are pregnant, you stop the hormonal therapy, take a break, get pregnant, have uh, the pregnancy and everything, and then you continue after delivery. You don't take it while, it's not safe, please. Okay. It's not safe to have it while pregnant. You stop all the treatments during you pregnancy. You stop all your treatments. You can't take it, you can't take, uh, you can't be on any active treatment while pregnant. Okay, okay. Is that okay? 
Yes, 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 it's fine. Okay. And just like Shola said, I, I just want to, I remember during my rhetorical days and somebody, and we were having a conversation and I realized that almost every woman there, both married and single, nearly all of them were not having sex. I, I don't, and they just, I think some of them felt it was not right, it was not necessary, it was not important. And I tried to stimulate that conversation that day so we could talk about it. And this is a serious problem. And just like Shola said, it comes from not loving yourself, for not thinking you are enough, for not thinking you are beautiful. And if you don't love yourself, how will somebody else love you? So that is what we have to know. You have to love yourself and people will love you just the way you are. Before my mastectomy, I was in a relationship and it continued after. And if I'm not in a relationship, it's because I don't want to be. Honestly, if I don't want to be, it's different. So I love myself and I attract people that love me the way I am. That is what I want all of us to learn. Thank you. I don't think there are any more questions. Salah, do you have more questions? Oh, no more questions. No more questions. I think there is one question in the chat box that says, can people with breast cancer implant breastfeed their babies? No. Maybe the person is looking for emphasis. Yeah. Well, if there is still a breast tissue, yes. If not, if the whole breast is removed, you mm -hmm. cannot breastfeed. But if women have just a breast implants for cosmetic purpose, they can breastfeed. Is that clear, Liz? Yes, 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 I think it's clear. Okay. Okay, I can't see any more questions here. I think we are done with all the questions. And so I'll pass it um, back to Mr. Ronsi. Okay, somebody said, I think it's just a mental thing. I mean, people are dealing with a lot, especially those that have been forced into menopause. So sex seems to be the last thing on your mind. Yes, I agree. But you have to be, you have to consciously refuse to make it the last thing of your mind if you want to remain sexually active. I want to keep your sexual health intact. Okay, somebody said, oh, we have another question. Can a patient with triple negative breast cancer go for hormonal treatment? Hormonal treatment? No, they can't. Yes. They are, uh, the, the disease is not uh, is, is negative, so it won't respond to it. Hello? Yes, yes, I, I heard that. Yes, but uh, I, okay. I, I replied, yes, if you mean the stimulation for pregnancy, they can go to stimulation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what is meant with this hormonal treatment, okay. but if, if it's triple negative, you don't need hormonal treatment for yeah okay yeah. I, I think the person that asked the question about breast implants is confused and she's asking breastfeed with breast implants as how i think she didn't understand we that. said if there's still breast tissue left yes but if not you can't breastfeed okay. if it's only one part of uh, in, in some cases it can be only one part of the breast left and one part is the implant exactly. so if in that case you can breastfeed but if it's the whole breast removed and replaced by yeah replaced by implant you cannot breastfeed okay Thank now you. she says okay yeah she understood mm. <laughs> yeah okay one, la one last question is it true folic acid stimulates estrogen and cause recurrence yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Okay. I'm not aware of that. I, when I was <laughs> pregnant, you guys get all this from. Yeah, I'm not aware of this well because when I was pregnant, I I had to take folic acid, so and my cancer didn't come back. So. <laughs> okay, um, thank you so much. I will hand over to to Chin on so. Chinas, are you on the call? No, not Chinon. So you have to call in Gloria Oji to provide goodwill message. Oh, yes, please. Um, so right now I'll I will call on Gloria, Mary Gloria, 
Oji Mwajogu, the president of Network of People Impacted by Cancer in Nigeria, to um, give us her goodwill message. Presido, are you on the call? Yes, I happen to be here. So, welcome. <laughs> so great listening to the topics. And uh, Saya, you were just super. And Dr. Shani and Dr. Tessie, we really, really gained a lot from here. Um, just like Gloria said, it's a topic that we don't talk much about. And um, when my group heard it, they were like, wow, because we are beginning to have a lot of younger persons in our support group. And this, I think we should repeat this again, probably in the next yes. near future, so that those that weren't in the group will definitely know more about it. And I agree with what Dr. Tessie said. I think we should be, medical professionals should be able to guide patients on this, even before treatment starts. It helps and it will go a long way in helping us. So, we, the Network of People in Pater by Cancer in Nigeria, we are so grateful for this and for all our speakers. You guys are wonderful. And we know that we'll do this again very soon. So, Taya, take care. Hello. Over to you, Gloria. Hello. I'm done. <laughs> OK. Thank you so much, President. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Rossi, I think it's time we take the photograph, right? Okay, yeah. So, um, let me pick up from here now. Thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, you. I just want to, um, before we move to the photograph, and um, my just a uh, very quick closing remark to really call on, I think we have Dennis, Dennis Edger here. Um, Dennis Edger, she's also um, a breast cancer survivor and as well as um, the presenter of a very popular national TV program in Nigeria. So Dennis Edger, if you are here, just provide a quick goodwill message as well as Dr. Oge. So you all are all the partners of Project Pinglu and the network of people impacted by cancer. I think it would be very good to hear you give some goodwill before we close. I know we're running out of time. Tanja, thank you so much for sticking around with us, but we're closing in the next few minutes. Uh, Dr. Oge or Dennis, Dr. Dennis Ejo. Thank you so much, Ronsi. Thank you. And uh, very, you know, I'm very overwhelmed by this topic, actually, because this is an area of the cancer treatment and the journey that we don't usually focus on as well as we should. And, uh, you know, just listening to the speakers, I must say thank you. Dr. Tessie, you broke it down. Dr. Shani, you know, all the questions and the answers. I must say to Ronsi and the team and, you know, all the organizers that this actually has to be repeated. We, you know, there are so many more, many more people who should be listening to this particular webinar, honestly speaking. So thank you very much. I gained a lot. I've been scribbling like, you know, <laughs> like crazy and you know, I'm just uh, very happy to have been able to join in this evening. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I just wanted to um, close right now because Dr. Denise Ejo uh, cannot speak at the moment. She's on traffic, but we really recognize you. And we also want to recognize um, other very important partners who are in this call with us today. And thank every one of you. You all kept to time. Uh, the Lagos Breast Cancer Support Group, thank you all so much. You guys, you know, co-created and generated this topic. And I want to also specially thank every one of you, um, every one of you are, um, from the Lagos Breast Cancer Support Group, uh, both from the Abuja Breast Cancer Support Group, as well as the network as well. Thank you all so much. This is really amazing. Um, I would really say that, um, you know, there's no better speakers that we would have brought to this meeting, you know, than, um, you know, Dr. Tanya, as well as Dr. Tessie and Dr. Shani. Um, different perspective and coming all together so, so well. Um, I thank you all so much. 
The last thing I just wanted to say is to all the champions to let you all know, this is more like an announcement. Uh, we are a member of Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance and the Advanced Breast Cancer Global Alliance greatly supported this meeting. They supported us and helped us to also connect us to Tanya, as well as to also connected us to Shani. So we want to specially thank the president, Dr. Fatima Cardoso and Roberta, who also did all the great work in bringing these fantastic speakers to us. Interestingly, I've known, um, I'm not sure I've met Tanya in person, but I think I've known you through some of your board members that I met at PIOF in Italy, the Patient Engagement Open Forum. Yeah, and then I've, I mean, Shani, we've met a couple of times during the ABC Global Alliance. So I just want to thank the ABC and thank you all for making our time. Then the last announcement I want to make is that, um, and thanks to Gloria as well for um, bringing that up as well, which means that it's a very big deal. We will have number two, we'll have another session like this uh, with the same speakers. So we're gonna have this meeting again, maybe in the next few months, maybe in the next two months or so, um, to re, you know, sort of um, review this meeting again and see how this can reach more other champions across the country. Yeah, so I strongly agree we should do that. But the last announcement I wanna bring is to tell you all that ABC Global Alliance started a, a partnership currently now in Mozambique, and they have a medication that they are trickling down um, through the Max Foundation to patients in Mozambique. Hello! <laughs> so guys, this is Shani's daughter. This is Tanya's daughter, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Tanya, does she want to say hello or say anything to us? Will you say hello? Say hello. Hello. Oh, hello, good girl. Hi. Hi, pretty. Gorgeous, gorgeous baby. Gorgeous baby. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Tanya, thank you so much for sharing, for allowing us to see her face. We really, really mean a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah. So um, the last announcement that I have is just consigning. Um, I was saying that ABC Global Alliance have a partnership with the Max Foundation, and they are bringing some medication to advanced breast cancer patients in Mozambique. So we are working very hard to ensure that the voices of advanced breast cancer patients in Nigeria are also heard. So I had a meeting with uh, the Mask Foundation group in, in ASCO in Chicago last month, and we are hoping to continue to further that conversation to see how that will happen. So after this meeting, you all will be receiving an email of a survey from ABC Global Alliance. So please, I want to appeal to every one of you to please complete this survey. The surveys that you see and so many other research that you see being churned out, are very useful in helping not just um, ABC Global Alliance, but global leaders to understand the pains and the challenges we're facing in Nigeria. You know, if you don't respond to these surveys, people will not know what is happening in this country. Some of us go out in these meetings, we talk, we speak up, but sometimes people can mistake it to be our personal opinion. But when the voices come from you all, it makes a lot of meaning because they can really see the evidence and the data behind what we are saying. So please, I just wanna to appeal to every one of you. I know sometimes it could be overwhelming, but these surveys and these feedbacks are so, so important. Um, the last one that you all filled about biomarker has, uh, I've started seeing a lot of people using it in many conversations to show that clinical trial, it's no longer available. It's not available to many of our patients in Nigeria. And I'm sure Dr. Tessie is uh, one of the very strong advocates wishing for a lot of clinical trial opportunity that could come to her facility at FMC Jabi, where she's actually innovatively not just providing medical oncology, but also providing psycho-oncology care. So I want to end here to tell you all that of the patients in the house, you will definitely, definitely get um, uh, the, the survey. Please feel free to complete it. If you need help, feel free to reach out to Shola or Gloria or G 
also Gloria Oku, all the champions who are part of the network for support. I think at this time, I'll just um, uh, pull it over to Chinon So for our group photograph. Okay. All right. So if you may, can you just turn on your videos, camera? So, yeah, if you can. And, um, um, okay, a couple of them. So we can go. If you need some makeup, feel free to... Feel free to brighten your face. You can see me. I'm already fixing my beer beer. It's too late. <laughs> I should have done that before. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Chino, so do you want are you ready? Um yes, you 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 do it, please. I'll do it, but I are we waiting for a few more people? Uh oh, okay. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. And then Shani also informed us that um, she was actually heading out for another meeting. So if we have uh, any question, let's feel free to send it to her via email and she can respond and we can trickle the, the email, the, the, her responses back to all the different WhatsApp groups. Yeah, so... She, she's really passionate about this and thank you so much. Okay, so let's smile and let's get the pictures. I will help Chinonso at this time. I like Dr. Tessie's smile and Shani's smile. <laughs> <laughs> thank yeah. you. Yeah, so we're taking the first slide. We have more people, so I'll move to the next slide. <laughs> 